Good morning, Motion Church. We're so glad you're here. Come on, go ahead and stand to your feet. I see the light that's breaking through the clouds. I feel the joy bursting at the seams. I have a hope. It's surging in my veins. I want it all. Your love revive me. No, I'm never gonna, ever gonna hide myself from you. No, I'm never gonna, ever gonna find a love that's true. No, I'm never gonna, ever gonna hide myself from you. No, I'm never gonna, ever gonna find a love that's true. special people we in the do. house. Hey, if it's your first time here at Motion Church, we just want to say thank you yes. for spending an hour out of your week and just checking us out. Uh, so on your way out, if you stop at the guest services table, we just want to give you a free gift just to say thank you for coming. Yeah, it means the world to us that you guys are here. So thanks for being here in person or joining us online for the first time. And hey, you know, we're new to the community. We moved here and then things got shut down, but we want to reach our community for Christ. It's not about us all us four and no more. We want to get as many people in here to hear about Jesus. And so one of the ways that we do that is through inviting. Inviting people say, hey, my church is at this place. Come check it out. It's different than maybe the church you grew up at with your grandma. It's different than your grandma's church. But, but God's doing something powerful. I'd love to have you. And so what we do at Motion is we make it easy for you to invite people to church. We have invite cards. And so it's an easy way. You might be like, I'm kind of shy. It's kind of uncomfortable. Hey, just drop an invite card. Say, hey, I'd love to have you come to my church. That simple. And you never know the power of, the, of an invite. They could see this. They could grab it and say, you know what? I need to get back in church. I need to get reconnected with God. And they might show up, have God change them, yeah. and then spend eternity 
forever in heaven because of an invite card. So I'd, I'd encourage you guys to do this. On the way out today, stop by guest services. We've got invite cards. Put some in your wallet. Put some in your purse. Invite people wherever you go. Let's reach our community for Jesus. That's what, that's what this is truly all about. Yeah, and hey, we're able to do what we do here at Motion Church and truly reach our community yeah. because you guys are so faithful with your giving. So if you want to give to God today, you can do that three ways. On your way out, you can drop your offering off. You can give online at motionchurch.org forward slash give. Or you can text to give to the number behind me on the screen. Yeah, thank you guys so much for your faithful giving. And I, I say this every time I intro worship, but I, I love worship music. I, I love the idea of worshiping God, but there's something special. There's like a, a spiritual synergy that takes place when we're in God's house with one another. We're, we're a family here at Motion, and we're worshiping God corporately together. And the Bible says this, that as we worship God, God inhabits the praises of his people. So as we worship God, God shows up in a powerful way in this place. And you know what? No matter what you came in with today, it might have been a great week. It might have been a tough week. But God will meet you in this, in this moment. God will, will do something powerful in your life. Let's connect with him. Let's press into him. If you guys would, stand back up to your feet and let's worship God together. Still you call me The faith is lost My hope exhausted You will be my strength When my mind says I'm not good enough God, you're enough for me yeah. I've decided I'm not giving up And you won't give up on me
The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Did 
do whatever you want to to do whatever you want to
We give you the opportunity to move in our life, in our church, in our families. God, do what only you can do. You know, when, when we give God the space to move, we get out of the way. That's when life, friends, gets so much better. Because I can try to make stuff happen on my own, but I, I, don't, I don't have what it takes. None of us do. Without God, we're inadequate. But with God, we have so much more than enough. That's when life gets so amazing, so good. Let us take a moment and give God the space to move in this place and in our life. God, we love you this morning. Thank you for your love for us. God, thank you that your plans are higher and better than our plans. And so, God, we just simply take a moment out of our, out of our weekend, out of our day, to make room for you to move in our life. To say, God, it's about you. It's not about us. It's about your plans, not about our ways. And, God, we're going to step out of, out of the way. We're going to get out of the, the driver's seat of the car of life and we're going to get into the passenger seat and allow you to drive us to the destiny that you have for us because god your your plans are so much greater so god maybe maybe we're here today there's somebody in this room watching online and they're just struggling with with life i pray that they would just stop trying to do it on their own and god lets you have the space to do your thing god you're powerful you're almighty and above all that you love us and you care about what goes on in our lives God, we thank you for that. We're undeserving, but we thank you so much. We give you the room today and throughout the rest of this week. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. amen. Can we give God a hand in this place? Give God a hand to worship. Guys, thanks so much for worshiping with us today. You may be seated. Once again, everybody, welcome to Motion Church. It's so great to see all of you guys in the house today. If you're joining us in person or if you're online, welcome. My name is Nolan and I am the pastor here. And I, I say this every week, but if today is your first time in person or online, man, it truly does mean the world to us that you'd stop in. Maybe you saw our sign. Maybe you saw one of the banners that we have across the city. Maybe you got an invite card that I talked about during announcements. But the fact that you, you took some time to show up and see what God is doing at our church it truly does mean the world to us. So we are so glad you're here. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here today. And we're continuing this morning in a teaching series that I, I, I'm enjoying. We've been over for the past four weeks. This will be our fifth week. But this, this, this teaching series is called Throwback. And what we're doing is we're, we're taking a look at things from the past. We're taking a look at things from the past. And, and how many of you guys know this? With time, some things simply get better, right? Like over time things get better. On the other side, sometimes over time, things get worse. Like I was trying to think, what, what gets worse over time? The most prime example that I could think of to bring to you today is this item. Okay, personally, I love drinking milk. Any, any fans of milk in the house? Like I could drink a gallon every couple days by myself. I love milk. But have you ever had the moment where you go into the kitchen and you break all mama's rules that she taught you whenever you were growing up to never drink out of the carton, right? She said, don't do that. Pour it into a cup. You, you go into the kitchen. You open up the refrigerator. You pop open the lid to that carton. And you start drinking. And there's like a, a chunky substance that hits your mouth. And you realize, oh, my goodness, my, my milk is now cottage cheese, right? That's, sorry, that's, that's gross this morning. Some things don't get better with time. But, but some things do. Prime example, my wife. My wife simply gets better with time. And listen, if you're a husband in the house, listen, if you're a guy that's dating a girl in the house today, you got to take moments like that just to suck up, okay? Because as, as guys, we're dumb, right? We do a lot of dumb things. We, we sometimes put our foot in our mouths. And so if you ever have an opportunity to, to just love on your wife, to brag on her a little bit, to, to just suck up, you need to take advantage of all of those moments because it's going to cover all the dumb things that we as guys tend to do. So what else gets better with time? When I think about, like, the technology when it comes to movies, over time, man, movies, the cinematography, the special effects, the graphics, the CGI, they've gotten so much better. Like, I love watching these new releases because the graphics are just insane. Like, don't get me wrong, I love the classics. There are some classic movies that have horrible graphics, but they're still really good. They're, they're fun for us to watch. But, but today, 
compared to like the 70s and the 50s and 60s, even some of the 80s movies, they're like a hundred times better. And what I, what I personally love is when Hollywood, what they do is they take an old classic and they revamp it and they remake it into something new. So like, so maybe it filmed back in the 60s and it was a classic, but then they bring it out in 2015. It's like, oh my gosh, this is so much better than it was before. Like for example, take the, take the Disney classic, the Jungle Book. Any fans of the Jungle Book in the house today? Jungle Book is a great movie. It's the bear. And the you know, that's that movie. We all probably watched it as kids. It came out in 1967. A lot of us grew up on it. But it, it, it had to be a cartoon because you couldn't get a, all these animals to be with a, a little kid, right? Because that animal would probably maul the kid to death. It would not be a good situation. However, in two, 2016... They came out with the new Jungle Book movie. They're going to throw this image up there. And this time, they didn't have to have cartoons. I mean, look how real that looks. That's, that's crazy. So over that time span, things just got better over the time. Another classic movie, The Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz. Any fans of The Wizard of Oz in the house? Great movie. I, I like watching that. It was originally, I didn't know how old it was. It was made in 1939. Of course, technology has changed. And what's funny, they filmed this movie in Technicolor, but most households didn't have, even, even like the most rich people didn't have color TVs at home until like the 50s, and most not till the 60s and 70s, so everybody always thought it was in black and white, but it was actually in Technicolor. Well, 2013, a, a sort of remake came out, Oz the Great and Powerful. So remember the, the old days of watching Wizard of Oz, and let's check out the quality of that. It's so cool. Another classic, I had to kind of think of the superheroes, Batman, Superman, Batman 1 in my mind. And so think back to, to the, the Batman that came out in 1989 where Jack Nicholson was the Joker and he looked pretty creepy, right? So check out these graphics here. That's, that's, I was born that year in 1989 and that looks absolutely horrible. It, looked, it, looks, it looks really bad. So 23 years later in 2012, The Dark Knight Rises came out. Fantastic movie, by the way. You need to watch it. But check out the video difference in just 23 years' time. Look at that. It's crazy. It just got better with time. And so the last movie that we're going to look at today, it's actually a, a series of movies, probably the, the greatest series of movies in movie history. And I know you might be thinking to yourself, Fast and Furious. No, I'm not talking about that. <laughs> I'm talking about Star Wars. Anybody like Star Wars? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something. I need to preface this, okay? I don't need anybody to get up and walk out. I don't need anybody to, to vow to leave the church after I say this. I had never seen a Star Wars movie till 2016. And that's the only one I've ever seen. I've never seen any more since that. I, I'm not a huge sci-fi guy, but I know some people just love Star Wars. It's world-renowned. It's famous everywhere. Like I said, don't judge me. But over the time... The quality of these movies has increased just exponentially. I mean, 1977, first Star Wars, Star Wars Episode Four, And I think this is why I didn't get into the series. Because back then, the graphics were so lame. I'm like, what am I going to watch this old movie for? It looks, it looks lame. So I never got into it. But check out the, the first. That's, go back one more. Go back. Check out. Okay, that's 1977. That's the first movie. The graphics aren't too, too great, right? So you fast forward 22 years, 1999, Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace comes out. There's a huge step up in quality. It looks a whole lot better than it did back then. Now, fast forward another 20 years, the latest Star Wars came out, The Rise of, of Skywalker, and it just looked, that's an epic shot. Like, talk about the cinematography, the, the, um, the special effects that, that took to make that happen. It's just wild. Some things get better with time. Now, what I'm, what I'm about to say, it might initially sound a little bit crazy. It, it might sound like, I don't know about that, Nolan. It, it stayed the same, but, but hear me out. I, I would say this. To me, personally, the Bible just gets better with time. Personally, to me, I just think the Bible continually gets better with time. And here's what I mean by that. It, it's easy to have the mentality that says this. You know, I've been in church my whole life. I went to Sunday school as a kid. One time at the church I went to, they challenged us to read through the Bible in the whole year, and I did it. I heard a lot of messages, a lot of stories from the Bible. And it's easy to get that mindset and think to yourself, what's the point of me continually reading it? I mean, if I, if I know all of the stories, 
If I've heard them already, if I've read them already, what's the point of continually diving into God's word? Here's why. I believe it's because the Bible just continues to get better with time. Now, have the words of the Bible changed? No, they're the same that they were originally all those years ago. But have you ever had this happen? Like for me, I, I've, I've had this happen so many times where I've, I might have read a, a story from the Bible 50 times, right? I've read it 50 times. And then on that 51st time, I'm reading that story. And then God just illuminates something that I'd never seen before. And it's like, that is exactly what I needed for this moment of life. That's exactly what, what I needed to hear with the problems and the situation that I'm facing. Friends, that's why digging into God's word is so continual are so, so important on a continual and consistent basis. That's why, why digging into God's word, not just from a preacher telling you on Sunday, but doing it at home is so vital to your spiritual growth because God continues to reveal things. God continues to show us things that changes us. So in this throwback teaching series, we're, we're taking a look at stories from the Old Testament. And, and listen, these stories are old, right? The, the name of the, 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 the collection of books is the Old Testament. They're, they're thousands of years old, but still today, in the year 2020, God can use these stories to speak something powerful, to speak something important that can meet us exactly where we are. So this morning, I want us to look at an incredibly powerful moment in biblical history for God's people, a, a throwback story that I believe that we can learn a lot from. It's found in Joshua chapter 3. You can find it in your Bibles on your phone. If you don't have it, it's all good. We'll throw it on the screen behind me. But just, just to kind of set up what's going on in the scene, God's people, the Israelites, are on the precipice of, of entering into the promised land that God had, had said that them and their ancestors would have had hundreds of years before. So there's this monumental moment that's about to take place. God's people had been promised this land, the land of Canaan, hundreds of years ago. And they were getting ready to finally enter into it. They're getting ready to finally enter into the promise, the destination that God had for them. It's a huge moment for God's people. Like, I don't know about you, but has anybody ever had a house built? Like, if, if you have a house built, if you're anything like me, I'm, I want to be there for every step of the process, Right? Like, I want to be there for every little thing, stop by every single day. You show up there one day, and it's like, oh, they moved some dirt today. How exciting. Now, is there anything exciting about moving dirt around? No, absolutely not. But here's what that means. You're one next step to getting done, to getting to the final thing. So the Israelites are on the final step before entering into the promise that God had for them. The anticipation for them was huge. They've been waiting for this for hundreds of years, and now they're, they're right there on the edge, getting ready to go into the land that God had for them. They're excited. But the only problem for them was there was a, a couple of obstacles in between them and their destination. First potential problem, their, their leader, God's people have been following this guy named Moses. You probably heard of Moses. He had been their leader for years, Moses was a phenomenal leader. Moses was an incredible leader. Moses was the guy that went to Pharaoh and said, Pharaoh, let God's people go. And after some reluctance, finally, through Moses' leadership, they're all released into freedom. Moses is the leader of God's people that went to the Red Sea, held up his arms, and the water parted, and they walked across on dry land. Moses is the guy who went up to the mountain and got the Ten Commandments. Moses is the guy that saw God's backside. Moses is the guy that had been leading them for years. And Moses had recently died. And now they have a new guy as their leader named Joshua. And up to that point, I mean, Joshua had some leadership experience. I mean, he was close to Moses. They were, he, was, he was in a leadership position. But how many of you know, until you're in that number one spot, you don't know true leadership. And so Joshua is now just becoming leader, and he's going to have to take God's people into the promised land. Potential problem number one. The next obstacle between, is that between the Israelites and the promised land stood this river called the Jordan River. Now today, if there's a river that we need to pass through to get to our destination, what do we do? We get into our car, we drive over the bridge, right? We get into a boat, we pass through it. It's, it's pretty simple for us today. We have bridges. But back then, they didn't have that. So they would literally have to cross through the river. And specifically, 
when it came to the Jordan River, there were times of the year where it would get at this thing called its flood stage. And when it was at its flood stage, it would be huge, very wide. The waters would be rushing. It would be impassable. And this is a, this time when they're about to cross into the promised land is when the river is at its flood stage. And I, I just got to just explain this. It's not like there are just a few people that are trying to get into the promised land. No, the Israelites had about 2 million people. So, so imagine getting 2 million people across a large gap of rushing water. And it's not just healthy people. You have the young. You have babies. You have elderly. You have those that are infirmed. You have all, all that stuff, plus all of their possessions, plus all of their animals. I mean, imagine trying to get all of that stuff across the Mississippi River without a bridge, a boat, or a barge. It ain't happening. It, it's not going to happen. But they had to get across to get to the promised land, and Joshua was the leader that God was going to use to get them there. Check out what Joshua tells the people of God in Joshua chapter 3, verse 5. He says this. It says, Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. I just want to stop right here real quick. It says, Consecrate yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. What does that word consecrate mean? It means purify yourself. Get yourself ready for God to do something great in your life. To do, to do something, a miracle, miraculous sized. And friends, I, I think so often, maybe we're, we're praying for God to do something great in our life, but we're not giving him the place in our life. And so he just doesn't simply move. We're like, God, I need you to do this, but I'm going to do my own thing. But thanks for answering my prayer. I think there's a consecration that needs to take place for God to move significantly in our life. So, so the next day, following Joshua's instructions, this is what happens. Twelve men were sent to carry the Ark of the Covenant. Ark of the Covenant like represented God on earth. It was like literally God's throne here on earth. And so these 12 men are supposed to walk out into the water, to wade out in there holding the covenant, and the rest of the 2 million Israelites were going to stand back. And here's what was going to happen. As these 12 men holding the Ark hit the water, God was going to cause the water, the river, to stop upstream, to pile up into a big heap, and eventually the riverbed was going to, to run dry and they could walk across on dry land. Now, if I'm one of the 12 guys that are picked to go wade into a rushing river, I'm going to think to myself, are you sure this is the right plan? Like, it, it, there's got to be something else that we can do. Are you, are you trying to get us all to drown? Do you see how fast the river is flowing and how white it is? This is crazy. But the Bible says that the 12 men holding the Ark of the Covenant were obedient. And it says, as soon as the men entered the water, 17 miles upstream, God caused all the water to pile up into a big heap. And over time, as the water flowed out, the entire riverbed dried up, and they were standing on dry land. So the people start walking across the riverbed. And just imagine 2 million people walking across the riverbed. Typically, at times, this river could be 100 feet wide. Now it was much larger. It's a big riverbed, 2 million people. Like, have you ever went to a, a Spurs game and left after the game was over? You know the traffic down there? It's a, it's a pain. It's frustrating trying to get home after the game. That's why you sneak out with like five minutes left unless it's a close one, right? So the, the AT&T Arena downtown seats 18,500 people. That's a lot of traffic after a game. We're talking about 2 million people. So this takes a while. God holds the water back for a while. These 12 men holding the ark, their shoulders are probably burning holding this ark of the covenant. But they continue to stay there and all of these people walk across. And finally, when all of God's people, when all of the Israelites are finally across the river, finally at this point they've entered into the promise that God had for them. And this is what God tells Joshua to do. Here's his, his instructions. We see it, Joshua chapter 4, verse 5 through 7. It's on the screen. It says, he told them, go into the middle of the Jordan, in front of the ark, the Lord's your God, and each of you, these 12 different guys, must pick up one stone and carry it on your shoulder, 12 stones in all, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Verse 6, we will use these stones to build a memorial. In the future, your children will ask you, what do these stones mean? 
Then you can tell them, they remind us that the Jordan River stopped flowing when the Ark of the Lord's Covenant went across. These stones will stand as a memorial among the people of Israel forever. And as all of these people walk across the dry riverbed, they finally reach the destination that God had for them. They they had received the promise that God had given them and their ancestors so many years ago. And when I read this, I think to myself, man, what a powerful story. What a a crazy, amazing story of God's provision, of God showing, of, of God doing what only he could do for his people. So I guess the question I would ask this morning is, what can we learn in 2020 from this throwback story? What what can God teach us from this story about his love and his grace and what he wants to accomplish in our life? I, I think, number one, we can learn from this story is that God always takes the first step. No, no matter what it is that we face, whatever obstacle that we have in our way, God always takes the first step. God initiates things on our behalf. I mean, if you look at this, this story that we just read, this is what God tells Joshua to do. He says, send the Ark of the Covenant into the water first. I mentioned it earlier, but the Ark of the Covenant it was literally God's throne on earth. God's presence was in the Ark of the Covenant. So what God was saying to Joshua is, hey, I'm going to take the first step. I'm going to step into the raging river first. Before you even have to get in there, I'm going to be there before you. And friends, can I just tell you this today? No matter what you're facing, no matter what you might face next week, no matter what you might face next month, God has already taken the first step to get you to the victory that he has for you. And you're not alone. Even though it might feel like you're alone and even though it might feel like that river that you have to get across is too big for even to have to think about, you're, you're not facing what you're going through alone. God, has, God is with you and he's already taken that first step to get you to the victory that he has for your life. And you might be thinking to yourself, okay, Nolan, that's, that's, that's one story that happened in the Bible all these years ago, but that's not true today. No, this is a reoccurring theme that we see in scripture. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2, we see this. Check out what God says in Isaiah 43, verse 2 to us. He says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. And what happens, friends, is as we're heading to the destination, to the place that God has for our life, trying to become all that we've become, when we, when we hit rivers, when we hit roadblocks, when we, when we hit tough times, here's what the devil tries to do. He tries to say, hey, you're in this river all by yourself and you aren't going to make it out. Don't listen to the lies. When you feel like you're in the fire of life and you're just being tested by all of the things that's going on, the devil's going to try and tell you, hey, you're in the fire by yourself. But no, the Bible says here that you might be in the fire, but God's not going to let you get set ablaze. God is with you, just like those three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. They thought that they were alone, but God was with them. We can have confidence that, that God's already taken that first step to get us to where we're supposed to be. God's with us. I think that the next thing we can learn from the story, number two, is that we have to take the next step. We have to take the next step. Listen, God was going to provide the way for Joshua and all of the Israelites to get across to the promised land, to, to pass through the river. God was going to provide the way. In fact, he already had. But I truly believe this. Had Joshua and the rest of the people not taken the next step, then they would have never entered into the promised land. That they would have never got to the destination that God had for them. Now, let me just ask you this today. What, what's the destination, what's the promised land that you're trying to get to in life right now? We'll talk about the ultimate promised land in a second, but, but what's that thing you're trying to get to? Maybe, maybe you've been struggling with a, a particular sin, a, a habit, an addiction, and for you, the promised land right now is finding freedom from that habit and freedom from that addiction and freedom from that problem. Maybe you're here today and... And the promised land for you is having peace and having joy and having just rest in your soul. But right now you find yourself full of fear and anxiety and you want to get to the the promised land of of peace. Maybe the promised land for you is financial freedom. 
And you want to live a life of, of generosity, but, but that's the promised land, but you find yourself kind of stuck down. I don't know what it is. There's so many different promised lands that all of us have. Here, here's what I know today. I believe that God wants to get you to where you're supposed to be, to be. And I believe that God has already taken the next step, but here's what we've got to do. We've got to take that step after Jesus does. After God takes his initial step, we've got to take the next step and trust him. But here's what I know. Because I've had moments in life where I was scared to step out in faith. Sometimes the first step on the way to your miracle is the scariest and requires the most faith. That, that first step can sometimes be the scariest and require the most, most faith. But when you do it, man, God does something special. I mean, just think about how anxious, how, how nervous. I mean, there had to have been a lot of thoughts going on in the back of Joshua's head, right? I mean, as he tells all these people, his first move as leader of God's people, he says, hey, I want you guys to, to walk into the water. God's going to stop the flow. I'm sure in the back of his head he's thinking, I hope God shows up. Like, I, I, hope, I, I hope I said the right thing. Because if I didn't, they're going to think I'm crazy. If I didn't, I'm going to look like a moron. If, if, I, if I didn't really hear from God... They might even kick me out as leader of all of God's people. That, that had to have been moving around in the back of, of Joshua's head. What will they think if this doesn't work? But because Joshua had taken the first step after God, he was able to see God do something special and significant. You know what? It would have been so much easier for, for Joshua to have copped out, right? This is what he could have said. He could have said, hey guys, right now the river's flowing like crazy. Right now it's probably a little dangerous for us to pass. Here's what we'll do. It's in flood stage right now. Let's just camp out here. Let, let's wait a few months. The waters are gonna go down. It'll be much easier for us to pass. Let's just hang out and wait. We'll, we'll get to the promised land eventually. We'll get to the promised land then. And here's what I, I think we do. I've done this so many times in life. We put off the promised land because we think it'll be easier to get there at a later date. We, we put off what God has for us, the great things that he wants to accomplish because it requires a little too much faith now. So we'll eventually, we'll eventually get there, but I'm just going to live wandering for the time being, waiting to get to what God has for me. And I, I would just remind you of this today. The generation before this generation that's about to pass over, the generation before, God's people had, to put, had a chance to walk into the promised land. God was gonna give them the victory, they were gonna walk through and take their place, but they didn't have faith and they walked away and an entire generation never got to enter into God's promise, why? Because they didn't have faith that God had already taken the first step, so they were scared to take the next step. Don't miss out, friends, because you're too worried to step out. God can be trusted. He's already taken that step. The last thing we can learn today is probably the most important. It's this reality that all of us, we have our own Jordan River to cross. We have our own Jordan River to cross. The, the story is, is full of a foreshadowing of what Jesus does for us when we step out in faith and trust him, not just with our situations, but when we trust God and Jesus with our soul. I mean, think, just think about the reality of what the Israelites and Joshua were facing before they stepped out in faith. They were in a wilderness. They were wandering. They were outside of God's purpose and outside of God's plans, just kind of getting through life, not really doing anything great at all. But when they decided to step outside of themselves and step into God's plans for them, God showed up. They were able to enter into the promised land. In the promised land, they found their purpose. In the, in the promised land, they found the destination that God had for them. In the promised land, they were fulfilled. I mean, think about us before Christ. Without Jesus, we're, we're just spiritually wandering around in the wilderness, lacking purpose, lacking a destination, just getting by, missing out on all that God has for us. But we make the decision to step out in faith into the river and say, God, I believe that you're gonna save me. I'm gonna trust you with my soul. When we do that, what happens? We enter into the promise that God has for us. No longer wandering, 
no longer in the spiritual wilderness. Now we have purpose, we have a plan, not just here on earth, but we have the promised land of heaven guaranteed for us forever. We, we gotta cross that own Jordan River, accepting Jesus as the leader of our life. We gotta, we gotta give him our all. And when we do that, we, we leave all of the, the mess of our past, all of the junk from, from back then, and we enter into a new life with God. You know, maybe, maybe you're here today, maybe you're, you're watching online, and if you're just honest with yourself, with God, you, you've never taken that, that step to cross over to your own Jordan River to get to the promise of heaven that God has for you, promise of a fulfilled life on earth that God has for you. If that's you, I would encourage you today, Jesus makes it easy. He made it easy. The Bible says that in order to be saved, all you have to do is confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you're saved just like that. Your past is wiped away. You're entering into God's family. Your eternity is secure. You have purpose here on earth. That's what it's about. And I would encourage you with this. After service, if you're here and you want to accept Jesus in just a few minutes when I dismiss, we'll have a couple people up here to pray with you, to help you navigate that decision and to pray with you about accepting Christ as your Savior. And listen, I mentioned this before. Joshua and the Israelites could have waited. They could have put it off. But if they would have put it off, they might have missed out on God's purpose and God's plan. They, they might have missed out. The Bible says we're not, we're not guaranteed tomorrow, so don't put off the best decision, the best step you could ever make, and that's accepting Jesus as the Lord and leader of your life. Don't put it off. My final thought. As the two million people entered into the promised land, here's what God told them to do. He told them to get 12 guys to go into the riverbed to get these 12 stones and to build a memorial to remember what God had done to remember the power of God, to remember the faithfulness of God, to remember that God could be trusted. Why did God do that? Here's, here's why I believe he did that. It's because he knew that even though they were in the promised land, that didn't mean that they were never gonna have another battle again. He, he knew that they were still gonna face problems and, and struggles and, and situations. And so he said, hey, build this monument, build this memorial with these stones, because whenever your faith is lacking, Whenever you're questioning, whenever you're going through a hard time, you can look back at these stones and say, hey, God was faithful back then. He's got to be faithful again today. And friends, for us, I, I believe that we need to do the same thing. We, we need to look back at the fact that God saved us from our past. God saved us from the mess that we used to be living in. God, God's rescued our soul. God's shown up time and time again. And when we, when we have this memorial in our minds set up, when we go through tough times, when our faith is wavering and we're struggling, we can look back and say, God was good to me back then. He's going to continue to be good to me again today. When the devil whispers in our ear, you're not going to make it through this. God doesn't really love you. You can look back and say, no, he does. Look at what he did then. He's going to do it for me this next time. Set up some things in your mind, in your spirit, in your heart to say, God was faithful then. He's going to be faithful again. God is a God that we can trust. Set up some reminders. No matter what you're going through, I, I say this often, but I think it's so true. If we can trust God with our soul, surely we can trust him with the things that we face here on earth. Remember today, God always takes the first step, then we've got to take the next step, and that's accepting Jesus. And when we do that, we enter into the promise that God has for us. That's what life is all about. We pray for us today. God, I thank you for every single person that's here watching online. God, I thank you that we don't go through life by ourselves. You're with us. You're there by us. You take that first step. And God, maybe there's some people in this room today that need to take the biggest step, and that's to accept you as the leader of their life. I pray that you would give them the, the, the encouragement. God, you give them the courage, God, the boldness to, to come up here in just a moment to meet with one of our prayer partners and to say, I want Jesus as the leader of my life. Let them accept you, and God, let their life be forever forever fulfilled by who you are. God, if there's others in this place and there's a promised land that you have for them that they're just struggling to reach, God, give them the faith to step out this week and to say, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going I'm to do what you've asked me to do. I'm going to become what you've called me to become. I'm not going to cower back in fear or put it off. I'm going to go after all that you have for me. God, as we do that, I pray that you would bless your people. 
God bless our church. God bless our, our family here at Motion Church. God, I pray that you would bless them this week. Bring them back next week. Keep them safe. Lord, we love you. We thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. Let's give God a hand real quick. Well, guys, at Motion Church, we, we love you. We say we're family. We are family. We're so glad that you guys are here today. If, if today is your first time, stop by guest services. We got a gift just to give you to say thanks for being here. We love you guys. See you back next week. Make it a great one.